Greetings everyone, Jonathan here, and as some of you, or most of you probably know by now, every once in a while when we're not able to get a brand new episode of Haunt Weekly together in time, we do one of these Redux episodes where we give a little love, a little time, and a little attention to an older episode that we think is really good and newer listeners may not have heard, even though they 100% should. And that's exactly what we're doing this week. We have an interview with Jake's Palace we did where he talks about cancerous actors. It is, Jake's is amazing. He's a longtime friend of the podcast. And this is, in my mind, like peak Jake's. This is Jake's being just great. So this is a wonderful episode Please, please, if you haven't heard this one, if you haven't heard it recently, stick around. It is a great one. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Um, however, I do want to say that normally when we do these, it's because one of us is sick or we're traveling or we had some kind of time or technical constraint where we couldn't get an episode together. And that is not what happened this time. This one's really, really frustrating. We had a topic presented to us. Um, we did a lot of research into it. I mean, we spent more time over this past week in pulling this episode together than I think we have on 99 plus percent of the episodes. It's just Crystal and I. I think other than some, like, some of the holiday or the research heavy ones, this was probably the most time we spent on an episode. And we were really excited to bring it to you. But as we were finishing up the show notes and getting to like T minus zero to record, we were putting in some background information and I want to be deliberately vague about this, but we ran across some information which made us uncomfortable with the possibility that we might be giving our tiny little platform, um, you know, and using our tiny little platform to boost, you know, people that support Nazis. I, I wish I were being hyperbolic. I wish this was an exaggeration, but that's legitimately the question placed before us. So we abruptly, at the very last minute, had to stop the episode we were working on. We're going to do some additional research, and we're going to do some outreach over the next few days. We may do it next week, and if so, we will explain in greater detail what happened. But we do not want to use our platform for that, I think, for very, very obvious reasons. And as a result, we are rather being safe rather than potentially sorry here. The situation is complicated. I know I'm not saying that the people involved are Nazis or Nazi supporters, but there seem to be some connections there that we want to get cleared up before we spend an hour talking about this thing. So on that note, everyone, please take a minute and enjoy this episode of Jake's Palace. It is awesome. If you have not heard it, I do not think you will be disappointed. And come back next week for fresh Haunt Weekly content. Sorry for the lack of anything new, but yeah, Sunday sucked, y'all. I'm not going to lie. It really sucked. Hopefully this one's better. See you in a week. Welcome to Haunt Weekly. Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan. I'm Crystal. And this is Haunt Weekly, a weekly podcast for the haunted attraction and haunted entertainment industry. Whether you're an actor, owner, or just plain aficionado, we aim to be a podcast for you. And the reign of interviews continues. Yes. But this time it's an old friend to the podcast, old friend to us, old friend to the industry. <laughs> Jake's Palace, actor, t instructor extraordinaire, has returned to help us continue the conversation on toxic, or should I say, cancerous actors. Japes, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I feel very fancy now that I'm an extraordinaire. Extraordinaire. <laughs> That's the one with the R-E at the end, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> you the full French spelling of that. How are you doing, though? I'm doing okay. Doing okay. You know, it's uh, it's been, been a busy couple months, but uh, summer is coming, so things will slow down a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, no, I'm just excited to be back. All right. Well, glad to have you and glad to have you in on this topic. I know when we did our first part on this, we said, I think about 25 times over the course of the episode, we really should speak to Japes about this. <laughs> really and so we moved heaven and earth. And by moving heaven and earth, I mean, ask nicely. And <laughs> Hey, some people that is heaven and earth. Hush up. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, and you, you have agreed to come back and uh, elucidate us further on this topic and, uh, and share some of your great stories 
of toxic or like you like to call them cancerous actors. And we'll get into that, I guess, as to why you call them cancerous. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I'm glad you had me back on. Cause I did, when I heard that, that first, uh, uh, podcast that you all did with toxic actors. I was the whole time I was just listening to it and I was like, Oh man, I really wish I'd been a part of this one. Um, cause I have a ton of experience with this. Um, you know, so, um, being in the haunt man or the actor management role, this is, this is what I spend the majority of my time dealing with is situations like this. And, uh, you know, over the years, I think I've developed a couple strategies and, you know, uh, ways of handling it that are that are pretty good. And also, when, I think one of the most difficult parts about dealing with these cancerous actors, and we'll define that here in a second, um, is, is being able to predict, you know, first of all, being able to identify them quickly, and then being able to predict how big a problem it's going to be. Um, that's, and I think that's something that just takes time. Um, and it also, I tend to go through worst case scenarios in my head all the time. Um, so, but, uh, as far as like toxic actors and, and, and I, you, you mentioned, I like to use the, the term cancerous. Um, and I, 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 I've really thought about that for a long time. Um, cause I remember my first haunt ever, um, I was immediately exposed to toxic and cancerous actors. Um, but it wasn't until a couple years later in my career that I started to realize that's what they were. Um, but with, with cancerous actors, uh, the, they're, they're infecting the body and the, the body is the whole haunt and the whole, every piece of it. Um, right. And depending on who they are, it's kind of localized. Um, the, the problem is kind of localized and, um, you have to identify that and then cut it out. And if you cut it out, everything can recover very quickly. Um, the, the reason I, I don't prefer toxic is to me, toxic, you know, a toxic, toxic, um, spreads, but, um, to clean it up, it takes a really, really long time. And if you get a cancerous actor quick enough and you're able to see the situation, things can clear up and, and hopefully you can have a, a recovery. Um, but you know, it's always going to come back um, that from year to year, there's going to be other cancerous actors and it's just a matter of kind of catching them. So um, that's my long winded explanation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a pretty good explanation. Um, so what do cancerous actors in your mind do? What makes an actor cancerous? So, you know, listening to your podcast, um, I felt like the, the last podcast, I felt like you started talking about just really annoying actors or actors that just sucked. Um, and that isn't in, in itself cancerous. Cancerous is generally going to be somebody who's affecting the overall show. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that comes down to usually a couple things. Um, number one would be like disrespect towards management. Um, and those people who kind of undermine the managers and discredit them. Um, and that to me is a huge problem. And I, I don't like to be like a top down manager, but I do understand that there has to be some level of respect um, for, for the people who are making the decisions for the show, you know? Um, so there's that. And then the other piece or the other type of person, generally speaking, and I'm sure we could, probably expand this out more if we thought about it but um the second type is the type that spreads disrespect and distrust amongst the crew for each other um you know somebody who's uh, causing drama and you know saying this girl said this thing and she didn't really say it and this guy said this thing or this guy has been hitting on me even though they've never even talked um you know the the people that just kind of invent situations that pits actors against each other or, or sometimes managers as well. Um, but they, they tend to be people who thrive in drama. Um, and you know, it, it's, you, you've, we've all dealt with this. I, I think we probably all know what I'm talking about here. The, the oh, over, yeah. you know, those, those types of folks. So, um, yeah, we've seen, um, one, one up haunt haunt that, that we were, were at, at had that, that problem, problem and it eventually split. Uh, they actually closed and the manager who was not 
causing all the drama opened up a, a different haunt and the other person who was uh, causing all of the problems wound up going somewhere else. So, so this was within the management. Uh, it was, uh, it was the owner, owner and like a Lieutenant, I guess you would yeah. say. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, to me that, that blows my mind, right? Like yeah. in, in the end, people who have to be the most together are the owners. And that's yeah. rare. That's rare that they're they're together. But you know that <laughs> that's who needs to be the most together is the owners. Um, and then selecting people to be around you, uh, the management, the lieutenants, as you mentioned, like that's so that's so key. You can't have you can't have to <clears throat> bring drama, you know, in your yeah. management crew. And if you recognize that they are bringing drama. And it's too late to turn back. You're in the middle of the season and you all of a sudden realize, oh, sh- curses. Uh, yeah. You know, this, this, this person is causing some problems. Um, you've got to be on top of that person hard. And you've got to know that what they're doing and then start over managing them and start you know, and make sure. Because, I mean, and again, if it's, a, if it's a safety issue, if it's, you know, I've had actor, actor managers who I found out later were hitting on all the girls. Like, that's a huge, huge problem. Huge right. problem. And that's not something that had, a, had I known earlier, I would have cut him immediately. I would have cut him right then. Um, it wasn't until after the season that people started mentioning it. And I was like, guys, <laughs> why didn't you tell me during the season? You're a little late, people. <laughs> yeah. Right. I would I would have done something about it. You know, you know, and I'm I make it very clear to everybody my expectations um at the beginning of the year and, and throughout the year. Like, you know, safety, especially in regards to, I don't know, relationships or, you know, um, Certainly, I don't want anybody. I, I don't want managers for sure using their power to coerce people into things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, right. You know, to me, that's a that's a huge, huge, like personal faux pas thing. I, you know, like like that to me is is about the wor- one of the worst things you can do in a haunt. Um, so, you know, when it, when it's within management, you you either. If it's a safety issue like that, you have to cut that out immediately. Um, and if, like I said, if you're already too far into the season to cut that person, then you might need to change up their role and and move and move people around. Um, because you just, if it's happening at that level, then it communicates to the crew that it's okay for this to happen. Yeah. And as soon as you create that culture of, oh, it's okay that, somebody is disrespecting other people, then it just spreads really, really fast. And that's kind of where that cancer metaphor comes in. Like if, if it's coming from the top, it spreads everywhere really fast. And then you've got no way of fixing it. That once, once you get there, there's, there's nothing you can do. Well, yeah, you have a way of fixing it. You shut the haunt down and reopen two years later. (laughs) Yes. Right. With with just the people who were actually loyal to you. (laughs) So, yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> Problem solved. Look at me. <laughs> yeah, so, not, that's not an ideal solution. <laughs> no, definitely not the ideal solution at all. Um, yeah. So yeah. So for, so you know, first is is definitely identifying those ma- you know those managers, making sure that 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 situation is good. If you've got good management that are keeping helping to keep things positive, then. Um, you know, again, again, my sort of my structure with um, having team leads. The nice thing about the team leads, um, and I, I just started coming up with a with a ratio the other day. So I'm going to throw this out here now, and this may change over time. Um, but I started kind of thinking about it from the the, the you know the, this, the elementary school teacher perspective that I have, um, and you know one of the biggest problems that you hear teachers complain about is class size. You know, um, I, at my school, my, my school is uh, one, one to 30. Um, so the classes are 30 students with one teacher, which right. is really, really difficult to get quality work done. Um, that's just too many people. So what I try, the rule that I've been kind of developing in my head is uh, for every 20 people you have, you should have one person managing them. 
Um, so like, that's why I have my team leads. They have, you know, they, they're running one attraction. If there's multiple attractions, they're running one attraction. And, and I try to keep it around 20 people. Cause if you have that, then you can really get to know the people and you spend time talking to people in between groups and at the end of the night and you start the, the, the team leads become the actor manager's eyes for where is the drama coming from? Right. Because as an actor manager, if I've got a crew of a hundred people, there's no way I can keep, I can't keep an eye on a hundred people. It's impossible. So having those team leads then reporting to me and going, Hey, look, I noticed this drama going on between this person and this person. Then I get to be the doctor. I switch to doctor mode and I say, okay, how big a deal is this right now? Do we need to deal with it right now? Is it a bigger deal than the drama that's going on in the other haunts? Or is it, is it something that could blow over? Um, and, you know, especially when you're dealing with kids, you're dealing with 16 year old kids, you know, 17 year olds, whatever your actors that are, that are a little younger, you know, sometimes there's going to be drama and it, it pops up and then it goes away. Um, but you want to recognize those patterns of, oh, this person always has this kind of drama and it's consistent. Now we need to start looking at what do we do next? Right. Um, so that's kind of, I think, how to identify it as, as, as an actor manager, you can't keep an eye on everybody unless you've got, you know, a crew of 20 people, in which case you can, you can manage that. Um, so you identify that and then you have to, like I said, kind of decide, is this something that I need to deal with right now? Or is it something that's going to blow over? And I think that's something that just kind of comes with time. I don't know if there's a good way to know that. I think age helps, you know, I'm old now. Um, and I know when I was, when I first started out in haunts, um, I couldn't do that. I couldn't look at a, a group. I was, I've been reflecting about one guy in particular lately about how I actually didn't recognize his talents enough. Um, and we ended up having a lot of, um, power struggles, he and I back in the day. Um, but now that I'm looking back at it, um, there was a way that I could have managed him better and there wouldn't have been those same power, power, um, struggles, um, because I could have recognized the great things that he was bringing to the table. Um, and then kind of pushing him in the areas where he was struggling. Um, and, and again, that was a lot of that guy that was undermining the the manager type of stuff. So, um, so let's see, we've diagnosed the problem now. What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? Right. So the approach that I have taken now is, um, uh, I try to find the strengths, you know, kind of, I guess, building off of what I was talking about with that guy, finding what, it, what are their strengths? There's got to be a reason why you want to keep them around right now. If it's somebody that you can't come up with any positives, then here's what you do. You go up to them and you say, uh, we don't need you here anymore. Thank you very much. Have a good night. That's it. There's no, if you can't come up with a single positive about that actor, something they bring to the table, then you just come to them and you say, here's what I need from you. And if you can't do that, then you're going to go. Or you just say, you're going to go. You can cut those ones out really quick. Those are the easy ones. But when you, when it's somebody who is, again, a manager in your organization or a really, really good actor or a really good makeup artist, somebody who really brings something to the table. This is where it gets a lot more challenging um, because now it's, we, we need them. You know, we, we need this person to help make our show really good. We rely on them. Now you have to start balancing out. Well, does their good outweigh their bad? Um, and if, and, and I think with those people, you just have to have some hard conversations. You have to pull them into a room, sit down and talk with them and say, look, here's what I'm seeing. Here's, you know, I, I'm sorry. I need to reframe that. Start with a positive, right? right, right. 
I don't know if you all are familiar with the compliment sandwich. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Right. Do a comp, you know, do, do that. The feed feedback sandwich. I think they call it. Um, start with something good. Hey, you're really good. Blah, blah, blah. Thank you so much for all the things you do. You really bring a lot to the hunt. You know, this issue has come to my attention though. I've, I've noticed this, this, and this. Now here's the thing about that centerpiece. Don't tell a person I heard this, that, or the other thing. People have been telling me this, that, or the other thing, because that immediately gives them an opportunity to say, well, that's not true. Right. right. Well, if, if the only evidence that I have is she said, he said something like that, then it's easy to discredit it and walk away and be like, no, I didn't do anything wrong. But yeah. if you bring, if you frame it of here is what I am seeing. Here is what I am hearing. Here is what I notice and make it a fact. It is a fact. You are doing this thing. I know it's a fact. You cannot back out of that. You need to now come up. We need to now come up with a plan for how you're going to change this thing. Um, And then, you know, at the end of the conversation, you bring it back to, I really hope that we can get this straightened out because you're such a valuable asset to our show. We want you here. You're, you know, you're a very talented well, person and God, that painting that you did is so great. Da, 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 da. Point out mm-hmm. something specific that they did so that you can really remind them, like, I noticed this awesome work that you did. And that's, yeah. go- that's going to hopefully give them the motivation to make those changes. And um, one thing that I, I found in team environments in general is when you're having these conversations to say, I would not be sitting here and doing this with you if I did not think you were a valuable asset. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great point. Yeah. You know, kind of throw it. Yeah. I I would not be bothering with this awkward conversation if I didn't think you were worth it. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, you know, I've, (laughs) I've pointed out, you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I've pointed that out to people when I'm talking with them that, Remember last week I got rid of this person and there was no conversation about it because I knew that they weren't helping out. You help out. You do a great job, you know, and, and like really, again, I like to point to specifics. It's for me, it's important to point to very specific incidents uh, uh, and times and examples of good or, or bad behavior. Um, you know, um, so I think it's it's really it's a matter of ha- sitting down and having conversations, and I think one of the challenges in doing that is um, that you know n- number one people don't like change and they don't like negative feedback. Um, so one thing I always try I establish from day one. I mean, literally the first day of actor training, I let everybody know you're going to get negative feedback. You're going to get feedback all the time. I'm going to be commenting on your on on everything that you do because I need you to know what you can do better so that we can always make this a better show. Right. But I really like I start talking about I specifically use the word feedback immediately and start establishing that culture of you're going to hear negative things sometimes and it's okay. It doesn't mean we hate you doesn't mean that we're, we're, we don't want you here. It just means that there's something that you need to work on. Um, and I think by creating that culture, you start to establish that it's okay. It is okay to get that stuff. You know, I wish, I honestly wish more people would come to me and give me feedback as a manager. What can I do better? You know, um, I've gotten to the point, I, I recently, I, I don't know if I mentioned this before, I recently was hanging out with my, my partner, Andy. And, uh, and I just looked at him and I go, what is the thing I need to change? (laughs) What is the worst thing about me? (laughs) He was like, Oh, Oh, okay. And we had a good conversation about it. And, and part of it was hard for me to hear. And I, I did, I found, I found myself defending myself. Um, like, well, but I do it because of this, you know, uh, (laughs) um, but at the same time I was open to hearing it. And, and I, tried to take it to heart and try to, you know, use some of his feedback uh, while still keeping the pieces that I think are important for me. Um, You know, but it's good. I think it's healthy and and good practice to sometimes just ask people that because nobody's, 
Nobody's going to come up to you and say, here's the worst thing about you. Well, very Especially when you're in a managerial role. Yes. Yes. Very, very rarely are people going to come up to you and just tell you like, this is the thing you need to change. Um, but if you ask people, then they'll tell you, you know, they'll yeah. tell you. So, um, but, but I think it's good exercise to do that because you, it puts you into their shoes too. Like all of a sudden now I've got a manager who's telling me I'm doing something wrong. What does it feel like? You know? Um, so I, I felt like that was a good experience for me and I, I kind of, um, and I'm glad I, I'm glad I did it, you know, to kind of have that. Um, but, but you're, but in a managerial role, like you said, it's, it, it's tough to get people to give you any kind of feedback. They just sit back and go, Oh yeah, of course, everything you're doing is fine. And then they go out to Denny's and God, Japes is a jerk, you know? <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 it was waffle helps. Hush yeah. up. <laughs> Yeah, we generally do Denny's around here. <laughs> gotcha. It's a regional thing, I think. We have Waffle House and Huddle House in the main ones here. Yeah. yeah. We got a Denny's and Metairie, don't we still? I think so. Yeah, I think we've got one somewhere. <laughs> Hanging around. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so that's, I think that's the, that's kind of the way to do it. I think uh, a lot of it is about creating a culture where, where people are going to have, are going to hear feedback. And, and also, you know, I can't say it enough times, and I think I say it every podcast, and I'm going to continue to say it. You have to establish expectations of behavior and be clear on those on those expectations. And because you said it once at the beginning of the year is not enough because you know you pick up new actors throughout the year. You have to constantly say it. And once you start to establish one of the things that I think is really cool is once you start to establish a crew that's constantly, you know, it's con- consistently coming back and, and they're here year after year and they keep hearing that message year after year, you don't have to tell the new kids anymore because it just, it just gets passed on from, you know, throughout the crew. It just right. becomes an expectation within the crew and you don't have to push it as a manager as much because you've already, everybody understands the expectations. Um, yeah. okay. You know, so it's, it, it is, but it is about consistently saying this is okay. And this is not okay. This is okay. And this is not okay. Um, but like I said, yeah. it, it does, it, that ends up spreading too. So maybe there's some sort of positive cancer. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I don't know. I don't know what that is. I, uh, uh, We'll have to uh, open our medical books on that one, <laughs> or, um, or just go to Red Dwarf and watch the episode about the, the luck, the luck the virus. Luck yeah, that's right. Yeah. I forgot about the luck virus. <laughs> okay, uh, so showing. but this brings us to two of the most <laughs> difficult situations, which are dealing with groups and dealing with kids. Yeah, one on one is tough enough. Yeah. but now we bring in you know the extenuating circumstances, if you will. All right. So just you bringing that up, I don't know if you can hear what I'm doing right now, but I just have to like rub my face, like put my head, my head in my hands. And start I was about running. to say, there's like a, a graveling, grinding noise coming yeah. through on your mic. <laughs> oh God. So let's, I would like to start with kids first, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. Bye. So um, kids are so difficult to deal with in a haunted house. Yeah. Um, and, and let's, let's define this by kids. I'm saying like really anybody under 15, 16, you know, generally speaking, that's going to be kind of, uh, you know, where, where haunts are, are, are hiring kids, you know, like, yeah, they're still kids, but now they're really employees, but the kids that I'm talking about, generally speaking, are going to be the children of your actors or the children of your managers. Oh right. God! Don't <laughs> oh, we're going to go into that, but it's going to be deep. Um, you know, it's it's kids who come because there's an adult there, and the hard part about them is they're usually attached to somebody who is indispensable. You know, yeah. it's it's that one guy that you've got that brings in his two kids, and one doesn't want to be there, the other one just doesn't get it. You know. Yeah. Um, and it's so difficult because, you you know, as parents, right, our child can do no wrong. 
My daughter, is, I don't know about, I don't know about anybody else, but my daughter is perfect, you know? Um, <laughs> well, she's also tiny right now. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. She's better in haunts than most people, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I saw the pictures. I guess I can agree with that. <laughs> yeah, I'm forced to agree, actually. Yeah, so. No, but you know, when parents have blinders, they put on blinders and they don't see that. And they're, and especially like if they're passionate about haunting, they're so excited to have their child with them and be a part of this experience for them. You know, it's, you know, it's just like, I joke, yeah, that she's, you know, she's the best in haunts, but like, I hope that she loves haunts as much as I do so that she can be a part of this when she gets older, you know? And, um, you know, and, but I, we have to then help people to kind of look at it from that business perspective of, look, I think your daughter is great and wonderful. And I, you know, I'm glad that you can have these bonding moments with her here and stuff, but look at what she's doing. You know, yeah. is that effective? Is, is what she's doing in the hunt? Is it scary? Is it effective? Um, or, you know, is it safe? You know, some kids go, they go crazy. And I've seen, I've seen like little kids, like 10 year old kids jumping around a room, knocking everything over, you know, breaking everything. And like, they, they're like, well, I'm little, so I can climb on everything. No, it's not designed for that. Like th- this little, this is, this is actually a cardboard box that was painted. That looked like <laughs> yeah. This is all held together with chewing gum and duct tape. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And, and cable ties. That's like the three things that make up a haunt. Exactly. And so so they're being unsafe or they're just not effective, you know. And and when they're not effective, of course, you want to coach them. Um, we uh, we did a – we had a problem of this, a big problem with this at one of the haunts that I worked at many years ago. All the owners had kids. Um, all the managers kind of, I think pretty much, yeah, like all the managers had kids. And so their kids were all kind of there and they, you know, of course they'd see all the adults wearing makeup and scaring people. So they'd want to wear makeup and scare people. And, um, right. you know, and then, well, you know, they lived in the place anyway, like when it was being built and everything, they were hanging out and they were playing, you know, hide and go seek and playing tag in the haunt. So they know their way around the haunt. So then it just becomes the next, you know, the natural next step is, of course, we're going to have makeup on and we're going to be in the hunt. Right. But they're like eight, and nine years old. They don't know how to scare people. Yeah. They're, you know, they're not going to hear any kind of direction. They're not going to take any kind of feedback. They're eight, and nine years old. They're just running around. So what this haunt did was built a basement scene. And put all the kids in a chain link fence, put them behind a (laughs) chain link fence with dog bowls and like, you know, like, so the kids were underneath there and they were just screaming and yelling and, you know, rubbing their, you know, running the, the dog bowls along the cage and everything. And meanwhile, up above, everything was kind of built up. Um, There were adults, you know, all around and kind of like celebrating the fact that they had trapped all these kids so it made for a really disturbing scene but yeah. really what it was was we needed somewhere to put the kids can i <laughs> yep. suggest in the off season operating a daycare yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's what it was it was the it was totally the daycare and it was funny because we would always have some like much older much more mature person in that room that we knew we could trust to keep the kids safe and keep an eye on them you know, right. and, and the cool thing was there were so many damn kids at the time oh. that we could put them underneath there. And when a couple of them got bored, they would go out and they would go to the lobby or they would go to the actor area. But there would still be enough underneath there that it wasn't empty. And right. even when they weren't there and it was empty, people didn't care because there was so much going on above. So it, it, it was it was it was extra it was an extra scene built into a scene that could carry itself. This, I think that's kind of makes pretty clever. Yeah. Really you clever. know, it, it, it was really, really smart. It was really, really smart. And I credit the guys for coming up with that. That was definitely, I don't do scene design or anything like that. So that was not my idea. Um, yeah. But after that, that was something I kind of kept in the back of my head where if we were having problems with little kids, you know, we, we came up with a way to, to, to solve it. Um, Instead of just sitting there and going, why do they have to bring their damn kids? Um, 
So I, I, I think it, kids have been, like I said, it's been such a huge thorn in my side. And um, I've been fortunate over the past couple of years to work in a haunt where it's 18 and over. You have to be 18 years to work there. Um, and so I haven't had to deal with that in a while. And, and I'm very happy that I don't have to deal with that. Um, because the, the other, the other alternative is if you can't build a good scene for those kids, you have to start weighing in those positives and negatives on their parents. Is it worth it for me to keep this guy around if his kid or kids are causing constant problems? Um, and the thing that sucks is you can lose really talented people because you just can't have their kids there. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Which I mean, but that's the problem with groups in general is uh, actors don't always come by themselves. They come in groups, right? Not necessarily right. in familial relationships. And you, you know, if one actor is really, really good, but his buddy that he insists on coming with is causing trouble, you could lose both in the same way. Right. And, yeah. and, you know, and it's, it's, it's funny because it's kind of this double edged sword of, <clears throat> you know, throughout the season, pretty much every meeting ends with don't forget to invite your friends. You know, like I, right. we're constantly, you know, trying to get new people in because, you know, we lose a couple actors each night. They, they burn out, they get tired. Um, they realize that it's work or, you know, life gets in the way. All of a sudden they can't get off of work anymore on the weekends, whatever happens. So we're, we're constantly losing people. So we're constantly asking the actors to bring in their friends who might be interested in doing this. But then what we do is we end up creating these groups. Everybody comes with a group. And if you cut out that one person, the whole group goes. Um, And one, one thing I've found in the past couple years in regards to groups is that in the early days, I felt like I was on eggshells when I, when I knew there was one person in the group that was causing a problem, I would kind of deal with it more than I should have. I would kind of just let it go. Um, but one thing I've learned is to start digging into that group a little bit more and start to figure out like, who's really, really invested now. Are they, I mean, cause if, if their sole motivation for being there is to be with their friends, then they're probably not that good either. Um, but if their motivation has now switched to, no, no, I love this haunt and I love being a part of this. I'm so glad that so-and-so brought me in, but now I'm having a great time and I don't need to be with them. I don't need to have them here. And you'll start to find that those groups can actually be kind of filtered. They can be kind of picked apart. Um, and, and, and like I've had people who were brought in by one person and then I got rid of that one person and the other people were like, thank God you got rid of him. God, he was such a pain in the ass, <laughs> you know? And it's like, whoa, what? <laughs> he was the guy that brought you in. I thought we were going to lose everybody. Oh no, he's been driving us crazy for a long time, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and so sometimes you're actually doing him a favor by, by getting rid of that person. Um, but, you know, this is a, again, one of those, another, this is, there's always that evaluative piece that, that goes into um, these type of decisions of, is it going to benefit me? Like, is it going to hurt? Is it going to do more damage to keep this person or get rid of them? Yeah. yeah I, lose, I lose four people, but you know what? Uh, three of them weren't very good actors uh, or one of, or two of them were decent actors, but two of them were causing drama. Right. Okay. Whatever. We, we get rid of them, you know? Um and, it, and, and, you know, the hard part, one of the, I think actually there's, there's a part that I didn't acknowledge and I need to acknowledge now. There is also that part of some of these people you're friends with, you know, you've become friends with, or you've been friends with, you know, I'm, you know, I would be terrified to like start a business with some of my friends who I've been working with in haunts for years. And then all of a sudden we start working together and I realize, uh Oh, this person's causing problems. I've been friends with this guy for 10 years and he's causing these problems. I can't just cut him, you know, especially right. if he's a partner or whatever. But like there is that personal piece that that makes it really, really difficult. Um, you know, I've, I've had I just oh God, two years ago, I had a problem with one of the one of the people who was working, who I was working with, who I've been friends with for a really, really long time. Um, 
but then I discovered that, you know, he was, he was getting high at during the show and yeah. like you guys mentioned in your, your other podcast, the problems with drugs and alcohol. Yeah. Right. Right. And I tend to lean more like alcohol is more of the problem for me. Like if you're drunk in the haunt, that's just not a good thing. You know, it, it's just not a good idea. Um, right. it, it's, it's pretty easy to detect and you tend to act a lot dumber and a lot less safe. Um, uh, and you know, if got, you know, if something, if, if you bump in a, a customer, you hit a customer, you do something like that, you know, and then the cops come and it's like, well, this guy is hammered. Why, why are you letting him work? Um, right. Right. Whereas being stoned, you know, people go on their break and they go out to their car and then they come back and they Febreze themselves. And, you know, I don't know anything about it, you know, um, I'm not going to say anything good here. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not going to say anything that's going to earn me points, but I tend to not worry as much about that. But what I do worry about especially with drug use is certainly uh, anything beyond marijuana, anything beyond weed is, is not okay for me. It's not something that I want in the haunt. Generally there, those drugs are going to make you act a lot more erratically um, and, and, you know, more dangerously. Um, But somebody who's stoned tends to not be a a huge threat. Um, And if, if that's what you need to get into the zone, okay, fine. But what I, where I have a real big problem though, is when they start to say, you know, somebody who's like senior in the company or, you know, you know, is a manager or something is then going out and getting high with the everybody else Mm -hmm. during the show. And then it just becomes, you create this culture where, Oh no, it's cool. Everybody just go get stoned. That's not, that's not a good thing either. You know, that's, that's a bad thing. Um, so I, um, <laughs> so yeah, we've got about uh, 20 odd minutes left here. Yeah. So, uh, do you want to start discussing some of your nightmare stories since yeah, you, you were to- uh, unintentionally segued into it? <laughs> I, I, I thought we could trade stories. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> now. So, so, so th- this piece I want to, I want to say, you know, um, it's not, these aren't necessarily toxic people because they're not people that are causing problems over a long time. They just did something so stupid that it was like, obviously we have to fire you. We have to get rid of this person or the situation when you did get rid of somebody was so nuts that that's, that's the story here. Uh, (laughs) um, But it doesn't necessarily mean that the person is cancerous. Um, So I can, I'll start. Okay, go ahead. (laughs) Please. So we had this group and we, we amongst management, we called them the four. I've called them the four for a very, very long time. So it's a group of four people. Um, but it's generally like headed by two people. Um, and, and the, the four, the, the other two were kind of rotating people. Um, it, it would always be somebody different now. Right. I've worked with this group of people at three different haunted houses. <laughs> I have fired this group of people from three different haunted <laughs> houses. <laughs> right. <laughs> so they're just not good. They're not good actors. Um, they, you know, they, they completely dismiss any kind of feedback. They completely dismiss anything that managers say, and they just kind of do their own thing. Um, But we were forced to keep them around sometimes because of the fact that there was four of them. And sometimes there was more, sometimes they would bring in their kids too. And so you would have like eight people, which was nice. You you know, you could fill rooms with them. And as long as you kind of just stayed out of their way, they would do an average job um, and they weren't damaging necessarily to the show. They just weren't adding that much. Right. But yeah, so I had, I had fired them from two different shows and then I got hired to do actor management for another show. And I walked in and I look into the audience (laughs) and there was 
the four were there. And then there was another guy. I think there were six people there that day who I had fired from previous haunts. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So that was, that was fun. The, the, the one, the one of those, not the four, but one of those people that was there, he worked himself out really fast. I told the management immediately to get rid of him and they didn't listen. Uh, but I think by the first weekend he had proven that he should be fired and he was fired. Um, but yeah. the, the four we kept around and it was the thing about them that was really difficult was they were insanely loyal. They lo- yeah. I mean, they loved being a part of the show, but they just really sucked. They were just not good. Um, but I mean, they really, really loved it. And <clears throat> so this is, yeah. yeah. So one night we, we had like a different vendors and stuff in our front, in our front room, our front or, or, or the front of the house, the waiting line area. We had wow. all these different vendors and we actually had a tattoo artist on hand who was giving tattoos while people were in line. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't know how this was legal, but apparently it was. Um, but um, because we had given him a place to to do his tattooing and stuff, what he told us was he would give everybody um, tattoos. Anybody on the crew that wanted a tattoo of our logo, of the Haunt logo, he would do for free. Hmm. So hmm. <laughs> the four had been really driving me crazy. They had been completely outright disrespecting and not listening to me. The one was sleeping in her scene frequently. Oh gosh. Um, and, yeah, and how the hell do you fall asleep in a haunt? You're not, it's not the first time I've heard that. I just have a hard time fathoming that. I mean, I understand being really exhausted and like, yeah. you know, you, you, you just worked a double and then you came to the haunt and blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, you were, you know, you were dumb and you stayed out last night and partied too late with the other actors. And then you came in and you were tired. And like, I understand that once in a while, but like, this was like a consistent thing. Like she was sleeping frequently. I had to, like, I would come in and have to like wake her up. Um, and a lot of times I would just walk, walk through the scene to see if she did anything and she wouldn't, you know, she wouldn't do anything. And so I would come back in and, you know, deal with it anyway. But yeah, so, (laughs) so I was kind of at my, my wits end with them. And uh, I was like, I talked to the management and I was like, look, I can't deal with this anymore. I'm I'm cutting them tomorrow. We're, we're done. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to let them get through the weekend. And then at the end of, at the end of tomorrow end of Sunday, whatever, we're going to let them go. And, you know, this way they get their last day so they can get their last day of pay and everything. Um, you know, I, I was trying to re- I honestly was trying to help them out as, as far as the way our pay scale worked. So they, so, so the end of Saturday night, they come up to me and they're like, James, look, we all just got tattoos. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, that's great guys oh good (laughs) so yeah but then the next day i fired him i had i i I was like i'm sorry i i i have to do it so but yeah they've got the tattoos though well (laughs) some bad decisions are forever seems like yeah that seems like a bad idea all around it also seems like um (sighs) I think it's Peter Pan, the song, everybody who signs up gets a free tattoo <laughs> so, <laughs> to join Captain Hook's crew. <laughs> so oh, you know, it's funny. I'm not a, I'm not a tattoo person. I have zero yeah. tattoos. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a big tattoo person, um, but that, you know, and that's kind of part of the reason, cause you know, I look at it and I'm like, well, what would have happened if, you know, 15 years ago, I had an 11th hour tattoo, like, right. Uh, I don't, I haven't worked for them for for years and you know, I, they don't even exist anymore, but I mean, you can kind of, I guess you can chalk it up to that was an experience in my life. That was a time in my life. And this is a thing that I did, you know, exactly. You could just go and get the tattoos logos from each of the ones you work at and then you'd be covered. (laughs) You know, I know, I honestly, I know a lot of people with dream reapers tattoos. Um, I think there might be one or two people out there that have dream reapers and asylum experiment tattoos. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, they, some people are into that. I'm just not into that. Yeah. Yeah, we're the same here. I'm I'm in the same boat. I uh, I think well, tattoos are beautiful. I appreciate the art and respect the craft, but yeah. none for me. Thank you. Yeah, I had a uh, great uncle who, when I was little, 
showed me his tattoos. He was in his uh, late fifties, early sixties, and they were uh, military tattoos. <laughs> and he's like, so don't get a tattoo. Cause this is what it'll look like when you get old. <laughs> <laughs> and you might, you know, want to change it later and can't. <laughs> so, yeah. Fair enough. If I ever get one, you know, I'm going to put a lot of thought into it. That's. <laughs> <laughs> God, I'm trying to think. We told uh, most of our really good actor nightmare stories last time. But I was remembering the cannibal, though, from the J.C. haunt we were at way back in the day. Yeah, he should have been fired. He sh- that was one that was <laughs> where a guy was not fired, though. He literally did everything I can think of to be fired. Yeah. You know what I mean, like he actually I, I actually heard him once uh, use the N word. In front, of a, in front of a, in front of a, um, it was a scene based haunt. It was the old classic style haunt. Um, we had guides and scenes, and it, he was the cannibal at a cannibal buffet, right? Right. And it, it's the old gag we've all seen. You have a real boy, um, put your head, put his head through the table. You lift the little like serving dish or whatever, and you look at what's for dinner tonight. And then he closes, it, and then of course the little boy slips on the table, sticks a fake head underneath, and um. Then the cannibal will rip it up and very quickly slice a knife and pretend to cut the head off. It's it's an old scare. It's been done for decades. Um, well, one time as I'm in the room, um, I can't remember why I was in the room because it was the room after mine. Um, mm-hmm. But I was in there and the little boy just didn't get the head up quick enough or something happened. And he said, well, there we'd be cutting that off that stupid little Edmund and, and, we're, and just dropped it right there in front of everyone. And I'm like so horrified. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this person was also allowed to use a real knife. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing about this guy was safe, sane, or reasonable. It's like, oh my god. Yeah, he like, was. He was also threatening and uh, made inappropriate comments to female actors. Yeah, he he was inappropriate yeah. to female actors. He physically threatened at least half the male actors. Yeah. There, it's just, there was nothing good about him, and I don't I don't know why he was not cut. Well, I, I think the problem is is that. And it's something that that we run into is a lot of times, even if you have someone that you know needs to be cut, if you're working on a volunteer only basis, the decision to cut them gets harder because it's harder to recruit people. Right. They But they had a deep enough bench, I think, at that haunt to put someone else in that role. I mean, that's not exactly the most complicated role. You give a little speech, you act a little crazy, you cut a fake head. I think I think I could have swung that one is what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, and, and again, it's 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 a it's it's evaluating whether or not the the drama, the problems that he brings are worth <clears> it for <throat> what he, you know, are, do the negatives out, outweigh or I'm sorry, do the positives outweigh the negatives? Not in this case. Anybody <laughs> you know, you know, threatening people and, you know, getting into altercations with actors on a regular basis, get them out. Like there's, yeah. th- there's no actor. There's no actor in my mind. That's good enough. I don't care if you do makeup and you act and you manage. Right. And you're threatening people and getting into fights with people. No, you're gone. Like yeah, I, I agree completely. There's no reason for that. I, I, and no. I think the other problem with that haunt was management, but we, we signed on mid season yeah. with them. We didn't, we actually were not even aware of their existence. They did such poor promotion that we were not aware of their existence until halfway through the season. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that should say something. We're like usually on top of this stuff, but yeah, we, we joined mid-season, and I think by that point, management are just completely given up and was just trying to run out the clock. Well, I don't know if it was that or um, if people didn't know how who to talk to in management. Yeah, that's true. I'm still not sure who my supervisor was. There, there were no um, higher levels anywhere in the actual haunt. Yeah. They were running the door. Yeah, they were all outside. There was no generals inside. You know, that... Um, that's funny. That leads into my my other good story. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I realized that I did a poor job. I, I wasn't doing as good a job as I as I sh- should have to let people know like who I was and what my role was because I started letting, um, you know, like the the, the act uh, the team managers or the, the actor manager or I'm sorry. Uh, the team leads rather the team leaders had kind of become my, my go-to people. And so I wanted people, I wanted the people that were working in the haunt to know them, but that didn't necessarily translate to understanding like who's managing the, the team leads. 
um, so one night I, I, this was the, the, the moment where I realized that I'd messed up. Um, one of the team leads calls and he's like, Japes, you got to get down. You got to get over here. This woman is like completely hammered uh, and she's got to go. And so I'm like, all right, yeah, come on. I, so I go in and it's, it's one of the actors. It's not a, not a customer. Uh, one of the actors is completely out of her mind, just totally jacked up. And so I'm like, I'm like, can, can you, I was like, would you come talk with me? And kind of, I pull her out like a fire exit, you know, escort her. I didn't pull her, but I escort yeah. her out of a fire exit. We go outside of the, of the fire exit and she's like, what's the problem? I want to get back in there. And I'm like, I love your passion. I love your enthusiasm. I'm glad you want to get back in there, but you seem a little intoxicated to me. Um, and she's like, look, I, I don't know who you are, but I want to get back in there. And I was like, oh, well, I'm in charge of all the actors. I'm, I'm the actor manager. My name is Japes. I'm sorry if we didn't get, you know, if I didn't introduce myself earlier tonight, you know, um, but you have been here a couple of days. So, you know, I, I thought you might know me, but if you don't, I apologize. That was my mistake. She's I'm like, but you know, you, you seem, you seem a little, a little intoxicated. Have you been drinking tonight? Well, I had a beer with dinner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a beer with dinner. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the hell is going on here. Well, she just starts escalating and like, I'm trying to stay calm, but she just starts, she starts yelling at me. She starts getting belligerent with me and everything. I'm like, all right, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to ask that you take the rest of the night off and you can come back as long as you come back sober tomorrow. That's fine. But I, I, you know, but I don't think tonight is a good night for you to be, you know, working at the haunt. Right. Well, she, that just sends, just sets her off. She starts screaming and yelling at me and I'm like, all right, you know what? At this point you are fired. You're not yeah. coming back. Yeah. Like I, I'm not, you can't talk to me this way. You can't act this way. You're not safe. You need to go. Um, so I, I managed to kind of slowly escort her. Now this whole process, I'm going to tell it in hopefully not the same amount of time that it took. Cause I don't think we have that time, um, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but this whole process was about a 40 minute process to get her out. Um, wow. so like, I bring her downstairs and I put her with the, with our, with one of our, with my actor manager partner. I'm like, hang out with her. Her husband is also here. So I have to go get him from his spot because he's going to need to bring her home. So I go and I talk to him and I pull him out you know, into the fire exit. I'm like, Hey, can we talk about your wife real quick? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, Oh no, what's going on? And I was like, well, uh, is she on drugs or alcohol or something? He's like, well, I think she had a drink with, with dinner, but you know, she also takes some pain pills and I think it might, you know, this might be affecting her. And I'm like, I think it's affecting her. Um, she's going to yeah. need to go and she's not going to be able to come back anymore. Um, you're welcome to come back if you would like, uh, you know, we've appreciated having you here, uh, but she's been belligerent and, and disrespectful and everything. Long story short, I get him down there. Um, he's escorting her out. She just turns around and starts screaming at me. And she's like, you know what? You're just, you're, you're blah, blah, blah. She's swearing at me and everything. And then she ends it with you Star Trek nerd. <laughs> <laughs> and I just stopped right there. And I, I walked up to her and I go, listen. I'm a Star Wars nerd. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It was so random. I don't know where she came up with that. It was, I, I don't talk about any kind of sci-fi stuff there or anything. I don't know. I've never wore a Star Trek or Star Wars shirt. I don't know where it came from. But she reached into her bag of insults. That was the best one she could pull out of the time. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she had a giant bag of insults probably a little weeded out because of whatever she was on she yeah. reached into the very bottom of it and got the very best one she could pull out and that was it that was it that's what she came up with yeah it kind of have you ever seen the, the movie roseanne is it roseanne roxanne roxanne, roxanne. roxanne yeah. yes the one with steve martin and hey yeah. big nose <laughs> how many insults can you come up that's better than big nose and they're doing the dark <laughs> yes <laughs> that whole sequence oh, oh man I don't need to go watch Roxanne again. See, this is what happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we got to finish watching the whole season, the season MST3K first, though. Yeah. <laughs> we got a lot more of those to get through. 
Oh man, but James, it's been so good having you. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm so glad it didn't take forty. Uh, it doesn't take forty minutes to extricate most actors. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. <laughs> But, you know, at least you took her best insult on the chin and we're a stronger man for it, I think. I, mean, I, I know it hurt. It hurt. I, I didn't sleep well for a couple of days. You know, I started analyzing my life. I was like, am I a Star Trek nerd? I don't know. <laughs> oh, you know, so. Is this what people really think of me? <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, most of my money that I got paid that season, because I get paid so well, um, <laughs> you know, it went into therapy so that I could go. Oh, you know, you know I, I, I understand. I, I wake up in a cold sweat sometimes. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, you are a true survivor, Japes. I, 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 I'm, <laughs> I'm humbled <laughs> by your ability to persevere. <laughs> oh, man. But, Japes, it's been great having you. I appreciate having you on. Uh, wonderful advice as usual. Yeah. yeah thanks, thanks for saving me on that ramble about the uh, marijuana. Appreciate that. <laughs> well japes real fast can you tell all the nice folks uh where they can find you and get uh coaching and other assistance from you you sure can um uh facebook is the best place to get in touch with me japes palace is my name j-a-p-e-s-p-a-l-l-e-s it's in the show notes yes, uh, so you can friend me on facebook and uh send me messages that way that's probably the best um you can also email me if you want um, I don't check my email as often as I probably should because it's filled with spam. Uh, but my email is mrjapes10 at gmail.com. So that's M R J A P E S 10, the number 10 at gmail.com. Uh, so you could get in touch with me through that. Um, otherwise, if you can't handle any of that, I'm sure you could probably post something on the, the show or on, on the Facebook page, yeah. the Hot Weekly Facebook page. Yeah, and we'll get it to him if that's And I'll, and I'll yeah. get it that way. Um, absolutely we'll forward it we'll, we'll, we'll be the mail forward it'll be his p.o box on this I, one i appreciate it yeah <laughs> get get hire him he's he's get his help with your actors just please don't call him a star trek nerd it, it, tra- traumatic <laughs> memories it's just, uh, it's brutal, it's triggers. It's brutal. It's, I, I actually feel it. a little nervous that i let that out publicly oh. Oh, oh gosh you know, I, I can understand because every time we have you on we have a lot of your the people that you know, yeah, uh, listen exactly. to the episode. So no. now they will have something to, I, to hold against you. I, yeah. I'm sorry if this leads <laughs> to additional trauma. I apologize. <laughs> well, thank you, James, for bearing your soul to us <laughs> and spending the past hour with us. Uh, once again, this is Haunt Weekly. Find more at hauntweekly.com, Haunt Weekly on Twitter, Haunt Weekly on Facebook. Until next time, I'm Jonathan. I'm Crystal. And this has been Haunt Weekly. Yeah, and that's Japes. That's a Star time. Trek nerd. It's a Star Trek nerd. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, yeah, you've started it. <laughs> I know, I know. It's it's over now. But thank <laughs> you very much for spending the past hour with us. We will see you guys next time.